<laughs> okay, so today we're going to take a look at section two. Now here, you're going to have to be able to show your work when you solve these limits. You can't just punch in your calculator and get the graph, otherwise I will count it wrong on the test. Problems, though, will look similar to what they looked like before. Okay? So the thing is, I need to figure out first off, does this thing have a limit? Well, what were the circumstances when you didn't have a limit? What were those three cases? Yeah. Yeah, so if it has an asymptote, right? If it increases or decreases without bound. If it's coming from the left to right to two different values, and what was the other one? If it oscillates back and forth between two values, okay? So if I want to find the limit of this one, well, first off, if I plug in two, is it a problem? Yeah, yeah it would make the denominator zero. If you plug in two and it, if it just works, then you were done. But because it doesn't exist, if you plug in two, we need to do some more work. Is there any way I could change the way this function, this equation looks without changing its value? The month of x minus two would change the value. You can do something talking about it, but that gets uglier. I want to make things a little simpler. What you do, what? Yeah, factor this top out. What does the numerator factor into? What two binomials? Yeah, negative two and plus four. So what happens when I do that? The x minus two can cancel. Now they're still affecting the graph, but you can actually get an idea of what this thing looks like because all you're left with is x plus four. Now, can I plug in the two now? Yeah, what do you get? Six. So the idea is to change the way the function looks without actually changing its value, and then plug in whatever you got. Not too bad? Does require factoring though. Everybody loves that so much, right? What about this one? Factor the denominator by grouping. So, if I group it at the bottom, what do I, can I take out of the first set? X squared, leaving me with? X minus 2. What can I take out of the second set? 2, leaving me with? x minus 2. So then my denominator becomes x squared plus 2 as well as x minus 2. Then what? Cancel out the x minus 2. So I still have the limit here going on as x approaches 2 of what? x squared plus 2. Can I plug in 2 now? Yeah, if you plug in 2, what do you get? One six. There's your limit. Not too bad. Yeah. Why can't we just put in two for the x? Two to the third is eight. Two times two squared. Eight. eight. So eight minus eight is zero. Two times two. Uh, minus four is zero plus zero is. Right. Yeah, you couldn't plug it into the original one. We just kind of jumped straight into this factoring. You're right. But you can't plug it into the original there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, sometimes they require a little more work. Can I just plug in the zero? No. No, I can't. So, any ideas? I want to somehow change the value of this function so that the x being zero is no longer an issue. Yeah, squaring. Squaring would change the value. That still changes the value, yes. You can multiply by the same number top and bottom, or you can like split something up or combine things together, simplify or factor, those type of things. Hold on one second. Okay, go first. Just the radical? The problem is all that's going to do is give me another radical here. Top and bottom, you mean? So what advantage will that give me? That'll just give me x squared on the bottom. Add would change the value. What? 
I didn't hear what he said. Say again. Yeah. The con- the top here you have. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, speak up. So, when I multiply by the conjugate of the top, what is the conjugate of the top? Square root of x plus 9 plus 3. If I multiply that top and bottom, well, what happens to the top? Yeah, square root of x plus 9 times square root of x plus 9 is just x plus 9. Minus 9. The inside and outside cancel off. The bottom, I'm actually just going to leave this because what's going to happen to the top? It's going to become just an X. So I end up with... Well, I'll go there in a second. X over X times the square root of X plus 9 plus 3. And then the X's go away. So you're left with the limit as X approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of X plus 9 plus 3. Everybody follow that. Plug in 0, what do you get? Yeah, 1 over the square root of 9 plus 3 is just 1 to 6. Yeah? Is there like a pattern that will always happen when you see like 1 over the confidence? If it's like a situation set up like that? Quite often, yes. Because they are going to throw fairly contrived examples at you for the most part. So you'll see that kind of thing come up again and again. As you go further into actual calc, you'll have more variety. Okay? So, now sometimes, honestly, like one like this, there is no good way to do this one. I can't factor the numerator that's going to leave me with a plus one. I guess I can. Why do they want you to do this on the table? What's that numerator factor to? Yeah, x plus 1, x minus 5. Okay. I saw the table there. I simply couldn't factor it. But yeah, the x plus 1 cancel. You get what? <laughs> you get what? Negative 6. Yeah, sorry. I thought they'd give you a table and I thought you were forcing me to use a table. In theory, if you couldn't actually factor it, you'd have to either use the table or use graphing. There you can, though, so I think why not. Anyway, uh, for this one, 1 minus cosine of x over x. Now, there's a reason they say graphing on this one. The problem is, if you do 1 plus cosine, you'll be able to get... Um, Something on top, and you're not going to be able to get an X that'll cancel off. Okay? So this one, you kind of are stuck graphing. If you graph this one, what's it look like? I would, I would just sketch the graph, just like a rough sketch of it. Have you seen my graph? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> they would say solve by graphing or something like that. Yeah. Otherwise, it's probably another way you can do it. Yeah. Or if you want to, you could actually solve with a table on that type of problem and then just draw the table. But to me, it's easier to draw the graph. I would probably, since there's cosine there. That's usually a fair place to start whenever you have cosine or sine. Um, if you're doing zoom trig now, it'll adjust for that, but I usually do radians just because you'll be able to see it easier at the start. Ooh, that looks cool. What's it look like? It looks like a... Well, it's kind of like cosine, except for it's going through the origin, right? So... It actually looks more like sine than cosine. But what's happening to it as you go on? It gets bigger. It's bigger? It's smaller. Well, it's Does it go up to start or does it go down? Did I draw it wrong? But remember, the limit of x approach is what? Zero. So I care what's going on here. Because this thing doesn't exist here. There's an open circle. If you hit trace, there's nothing there, right? So then what is the actual y value here approaching? Zero. So your answer is zero. What type of graph is this? 
And we're seeing lesson and lesson as you go on. The term for it. What? Dampen. The dampen. That we did it earlier this year. <laughs> All right. Now, one other way you can check to just confirm whether something does or does not have a limit. That you can actually have some of those graphs where they have two different values, one approaching from the left, one from the right. You can actually look for what's called a left-handed limit or a right-handed limit. The way they'll show this is with a negative superscripted after the value or a positive. It kind of looks like it's in the exponent. It doesn't actually mean the exponent. It's just a symbol meaning you're approaching the limit value from the left or you're approaching it from the right. Okay? So if I look at one like this that normally would have no actual solution, no actual limit, I should say, but they want to look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of this function. And they want to look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of that same function. Well, what does this function look like? Well, think, let's think about values. If I plug in 1, what am I going to get? 1 fourth. If I plug in 2, what am I going to get? Which is 1 fourth. If I plug in 100, what am I going to get? 1 fourth. Okay? So, what's the difference, though, if I plug in a negative number? Negative 1 fourth. So, the idea is if I have 1 fourth here, negative 1 fourth here, and it does not exist at 0. Same as the graph we looked at before, the scale is a little different. So, what's the limit as you approach from the left? Negative one fourth. What's the limit as you approach from the right? Positive one fourth. Now, because those two values are different, they do. Ha it does have a left hand limit. It does have a right hand limit. Does it have an overall limit? No. Does that make sense? These would just be the same value. Yeah. If it had a limit, these numbers would be the same. So that's actually also a good test for whether something has an overall limit is to look at the left-handed limit, look at the right-handed limit, and go from there. Because that's what this is talking about. If it has the same value coming from left and from right, then that value is the same as the overall limit. So if I have a function like this, find the limit of f of x as x approaches 2. Well, the I have two different functions here, right? Well, it's a piecewise function. I have one for the behavior when x is less than 2, one follows this when x is greater than 2. So what I can do for this is actually split it up. I'm going to do the left-handed limit. Now, which function would be the left-handed limit? Yeah, the top up here when x is less than 2. That's the left-handed one. So that's x squared plus 1. Now, this is just a regular polynomial, right? So what can I do? Plug in the number. There's no weird fraction going on here, no square roots, anything like that. So I can just plug in 2. And what do I get? 5. So the limit, the left-hand limit of this thing is 5. The right-hand limit, so as I approach 2 from the right, though, is going to follow the other equation. Oops. I plug plus line. So that's going to follow the negative 1 half x plus 6. So what would I do to find the right-hand limit? Plug in 2. What do you get when you plug in 2? 5. So because you have both of those statements going on, where you have the same value, you can actually find the overall limit based on that. The overall limit as x approaches 2, then, of that function is just 5. And that's kind of your justification of why. Because you know it has this left-hand limit, you know it has this right-hand limit. Since they're the same thing, the overall limit is also 5. Does that make sense? Okay. So, let's do a word problem. You ship a package overnight. The delivery service charges $9 for the first pound and $1 for each additional pound or portion of the pound. Let X represent the weight of the package and let F of X represent the shipping cost. Show that the limit as of F of X as X approaches 3 does not exist. So, they're telling you it does not exist. You're trying to show why. Any ideas where to start? Mm 
You can turn it into an equation. What's the equation going to consist of, though? 9 plus what? This plus x? Minus 1? Would that work? What? Does what? You remember what that's called? It's a type of step function. Specifically, the greatest integer function. Because you'd always want to round this up. Right? Okay. So, that would work. Well, there's actually an easier way. Split it up. You know that this function would have to equal 9 when what's true about x? Yeah. Well, more specifically, though, it's bigger than 0, but less than or equal to 1, right? Assuming you're not going to ship a package that weighs less than a pound, right? Or less than 0 pounds. Would be. 10 would be occur, would occur when? <laughs> For one less than, not less than or equal to, less than two, right? How far do I need to go? Just the three? Or would I actually need to go one more? Yeah. Because I need to see what's happening after 3 as well. So then I'm going to use what we just did. I'm going to think about this in terms of the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this function would give you what? Well, which one of these things is that's x approaching 3 from the left? Yeah, the 11. What is the limit as x approaches 3 from the right? 12. So, what's that mean? Yeah, so because of that, therefore, the limit as x approaches 3 does not exist. So this would kind of be your answer, and this would kind of be the work for that answer. This would be the justification for why that doesn't work. Does that make sense? You could also, I mean, you could do some of the greatest integer function, but this is just faster, I think. Okay. Now for the fun one. Now, we've done this before. I remember the difference quotient, right? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. This should look familiar. The thing we're tacking on to it is making h go to zero. And the problem is, by default, if I make h go to zero, what happens? It doesn't exist. It becomes undefined, however you want to call it. So, what I'm going to do is take that difference quotient and apply it to a given function. Now, they're actually being very, even more specific. They're saying, okay, make the x2. And remember how to use this difference quotient. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I want to find f of 2 plus h. Because then I'm going to take that answer and put it in here. What is f of 2 plus h? So the idea is that I just rip out the x and put it in 2 plus h. Simplify it. What do I get when I square 2 plus h? Or h plus h squared. Distribute the 2. And then what do you end up with finally? Plus 9. What else do I need? F of 2. That one's a little bit easier. What's the f of 2? 9. So the idea is, what am I going to do with those? Subtract them. So I'm going to take those and I'm going to plug those in up here. This half of the numerator, so I still have the limit as h approaches 0. This half of the numerator is 2h squared plus 8h plus 9. And then minus the other one, which is just 
9. So then what? The 9's cancel. So I'm left with h approaching 0, 2h squared plus 8h over h. Yeah, so then you can cancel 1h from every term. So you get 2h plus 8. So as h is approaching 0, you get 8. Yeah, it should be 8. Make sure you practice this kind of problem on the homework because we will do this a lot. Okay? Questions on any of it? Good. Uh, Monday is just going to be working on this stuff. Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll look at 12.3. Uh, Thursday, Friday, we'll look at 12.4. Yep. So it's short in classes. Yep. The rest of the time is yours.